was uh, in my living room practicing this. <clears throat> this morning I'm preaching from just one verse, uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 1. So I'm going to read that, and then we'll get into this. Finally then, brothers, we ask and urge you in the Lord Jesus that as you received, us, received from us how you ought to walk in the walk and to please God just as you are doing that you do more and more <clears throat> excuse me let me take a breath so what does this say um first I think to get into what this really means we want to get to the history of this and understand that Paul um this was his first epistle uh the first two epistles Paul wrote were first Thessalonians and then the second the third one was second Thessalonians but Paul went um, on his second missionary trip, and he ended up in Thessalonica where they were worshiping Baal and, and other idols, um, carved, handmade, man-made idols. And they were routinely <coughs> excuse me, going to the temple to seek out temple prostitutes in order to worship. That's how they worshiped. And this is what Paul was up against here. Now, um, I think, Gilbert, you planted a church in McDonough. Um, Paul planted a church in, in Thessalonica in one month, or a little over, a little under one month. And then there were a lot of judgmental Jewish people living there that kind of ran him off, so he had to leave and kind of manage that church through letters. And they didn't have email or, or even the post office back then, so I, I can only imagine the challenge he was up against. So the first three chapters Paul wrote in, in Thessalonians was just to uh, tell the brothers how much he loved them, how much he missed them, and just to encourage them to continue to do what they're doing. And um, one thing that we see in this text, um, Paul's talking about how the brothers are walking in Jesus, their walk with Christ. Um, Gilbert, you touched on this. Um, there, there's two aspects to walking in Christ, their physical walk, where they were making disciples as they were traveling around and dealing with people. But then there was their, also their spiritual walk, and I think that that is what he's encouraging them in here, is to continue their, their spiritual walk with Christ and to continue to do the job that they're doing. Um, imagine telling people that were, were worshiping man-made objects that you've got something real that they can worship, something that not only is not man-made, but made man. And uh, I think this is, is a good way to look at this um, when we're talking to people or trying to make disciples. Um, the other thing that we hear in, in the end of this text is to do more and more. And, and we hear it duplicated there, not just do more, but do more and more. And to me, what I see here is, is Paul saying, don't just make disciples, but make disciples that will make disciples. So wh what good is a fruit tree if it doesn't bear fruit? Um, th this is where Paul is going with this. He's saying we've, we've got to go out and do more and more. And, and I want everybody to just ask themselves, do we feel like we're doing more and more? Um, a story that, that I heard one time from from somebody I don't even remember who was, uh, what if your phone rang and you looked down and said, Jesus Christ, and you're like, what? I never put that dude's number in my phone. Let me see who this is. Hello? And then Jesus is on the other line, and he convinces you that it's really him with whatever obscure fact he knows about you, something deep down that we've probably hidden for all our lives. And he says, uh, Michael, Mark, whoever it might be, hey, I'm coming next Friday. just want you to know. You're like, what? Jesus is coming Friday? What do I do at that point? What do I do with that information? Do I liquidate everything I own and go take that dream trip to Paris with my family first class? Do I go to Machu Picchu? Um, maybe go to the Alps? And, and do some hiking or skiing or whatever we've always dreamed of doing. I think everybody in this room knows what they're going to do. They're going to go tell everybody they know that Jesus is coming, right? Well, guess what, guys? Jesus is coming. He's coming. And we know that. 
Everybody in this room, I hope, knows that. If you don't, I'd love to talk to you. Um, but, but given that information, what are we going to do with that fact? We've got to go out and tell everybody, right? <coughs> We've got to live for eternity, not for today. And um, I just want to encourage everybody to find one or two guys that you can disciple and then teach them to make disciples. Um, the one thing that I was worried about was going too long, and I think I've sold myself short here. But, <laughs> excuse me, I left my notes at home because I was going to be so good and strong that I could just get up here and do it. Um, in my notes, I, I had another story that I wanted to share, and um, it's, it's just about excitement. I want, I want everybody to leave here today, if you get nothing from me, just, just to be the one thing that, that you're excited to go out and live for Christ and to do to do the work that we need to do for him and to, to just remember that today is fleeting. It really is. Um, we've only got eternity, and that's forever and ever. So let's live for that. Um, let's be excited. Let's be excited. I, this, the story I was going to tell, Mark told me I probably shouldn't, but I'm going to anyway because I have bad judgment. Um, when, when I was a kid, my dad, and he left when I was nine for good, but when I was six, seven, and eight, he would leave for three months at a time, claiming he was going to look for work, but God only knows what he was doing. But my dad was Irish, so he drank a lot of hot tea. And uh, one of my fondest childhood memories of him was hearing that teapot just whistling every morning. And I'd jump up out of bed and go in and hug my dad because everybody loved their dad. Well, my dad left, and he was gone for about six months, and I woke up one morning, and I heard that teapot whistling. Man, I was excited. Went running in there and just saw my dad there. You know, it was just the best feeling. And then last year, we were standing in the kitchen. My wife's a school teacher, and her and my little girl were leaving for work and school. And I was making some, boiling some water to put into my French press to make coffee, and the teapot started whistling. I broke down crying like a, a baby just having a tantrum, uncontrollably crying because of the memory that I had repressed all those years that came back to me of my dad um, and the excitement that I felt when I heard that teapot whistle in that morning. And I just wonder if, if we could all look towards Christ and his coming back and be that excited and just want to just run to him and worship him, fall at our knees in front of him and worship him. Um, in the text here, there, there are a couple more things that I do want to go over. Um, so you can tell I'm nervous. Some of these thoughts are just coming back as bits and pieces. But, but Paul talks about how we should walk to please God. And he's urging the Thessalonians or the Thessalonians. We're Americans because we live in America. So Thessalonians is what I call them. We're not Americonians. But anyway, um, he's urging them to do more and to walk in Christ. And I think that as brothers, we should be constantly urging each other to do more and, and just encouraging one another. Call your, go through your phone and, and see somebody that you know that might be hurting or might be needing something or wondering if they can stand up in front of a bunch of guys with bright lights in their face and preach for 20 minutes and stretch eight minutes worth of words into 20 but but encourage one another hold one another up and I was talking to Michael Bateman this morning about some things and and he was saying brother if I see you in sin I'm going to call you out in it well that doesn't mean Michael's being mean to me that means he cares about me and we should all care about one another enough to just urge one another on and and hold a, hold one another accountable in a loving and caring way so if you guys would Bow your heads. I'd just like to pray for us real quick. God, thank you for gathering me here with these men. Um, thank you for gathering these men here. I, I pray, Lord, that they they just hear hear the word today and that they hear the truth, that they have a yearning and a desire to do more. Um, obviously, if they're here, they want to do more. I pray that they do more and more, Lord, that you give them a desire to do just that. Um, Pray that you watch over their families, Lord, and that you give them a desire to teach their families and disciple them. Um, 
I just ask, Lord, that you continue this preaching lab with, with lots of encouraging words. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.